So, uh, there have been several changes in the schedule, as uh, uh, you've seen and heard maybe from me as well. Uh, we are still in a COVID world. Uh, there have been people with visa problems. There have been people that have catch COVID and couldn't come. Uh, so we have been uh, we've had to turn upside down the program uh, <laughs> quite a bit. And I had myself as a backup speaker, as I usually do, because I wanted to talk about um, password cracking and what I think about doing that ethically and morally, this is sort of a discussion that we've had ongoing with PasswordsCon for many years already. It started back in uh, 2015 at the University of Cambridge in UK, uh, where we um, had a speaker from Russia. Uh, she wasn't really that interested in password cracking, but her husband was uh, really interested in doing this stuff. And she did a talk about the ethics of doing password cracking. Because in most cases, we are downloading data that has been copied illegally or stolen or whatever you want to call it from some service, some company out there. And we crack the passwords, we see the emails, we see the usernames, the real names and so on of those people. And there's the thing about, you know, is this legally? allowed to do? Is it ethical? Is it moral to do? Now, during the years, I have experienced my fair share of shit. Um, and I've been thinking about a lot about this. Would I have, would I have done myself cracking <laughs> millions and millions and millions of passwords during the past 22, 23 years and still not ongoing? And I also thought that, well, doing that as a talk to finish off PasswordsCon in Las Vegas is probably not the best idea I can do. So, and now also waiting for Jeremy Gosney, I thought that, well, instead of just doing sad stuff, I will show you a couple of slides that I've been doing lately uh, as part of almost a lightning talk. Uh, with some fun stuff in it. Uh, some might have seen this before, uh, some might not. But I will start with the, uh, the simple part. So this is the license plate of my car. Uh, zero points for guessing what it says in Norwegian on that plate. And this is also the quote that I have on Twitter. Uh, I said that I have a reputation to maintain. I have it verbally from Cormac Hurley at Microsoft Research with a witness present that he's interested in passwords, well, I'm obsessed with it. And I do ask Cormac to please confirm statements. And he responds in public, confirm, I have a healthy curiosity while Tosem is pathologically obsessed. And I'm actually proud of getting that from Cormac because he's really good at his research. And he has done research into passwords and usability stuff for, for quite a few years. You might also have seen this, but I use this to sort of exemplify what I say is the value of a single password. This happened quite a few years ago. This is Twitter. This is Associated Press, one of the largest news agencies in the world. At the time, they had 2 million followers. And one day, suddenly uh, tweeted the message saying, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. Now, there were never any explosions there, and there were never, uh, you know, Barack Obama was never injured in any way. And it's sort of crazy to think that way, well, why would a news agency put out a tweet like that? And it's also interesting to see that in this case, this tweet appeared only with Associated Press. It was not mentioned, it was not published in any other media, no other channel at all of Associated Press, only on Twitter. And this was before Twitter had to have authentication. So you can probably guess where I'm going with this. And this is the Dow Jones index that day. You can see in the morning that, you know, Dow is going up and it's pretty good. It looks like a good day. And you can probably spot the location where suddenly AP tweets that there has been explosions and the president is injured. Now, 
That drop in the Dow Jones index was $136.5 billion in worth. That's a lot of money. And they had to stop trading to figure out, you know, what the hell is this message from AP about? And of course, yep, this is, this is not for real. And they could reestablish tra trading and everything went smoothly. At least it looks like that the rest of the way. And this happened because Jeremy Gosling is in the house. The man, the legend. Bye, Jeremy. Hey, Bye. Hi, baby doll. Hi, family. <laughs> I just started talking, waiting for you, Jeremy. I'm just filling in with some crap. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Just shit. The point is here, AP got fished. Two or three, maybe four people at AP got an email, they clicked the link. One of them was tricked into giving away username and password for the AP Twitter account. And it was actually the Syrian Electronic Army who claimed to have done this. They have ceased to exist, I think. I don't know if they're dead. But they did a lot of really interesting hacks back in the days. And I say that, well, the value of a single password is $136.5 billion in worst case. And even more fun, I said this one earlier today, but here's the uh, graphical explanation, operation face factor, 5,000 photos of people, and also we knew the passwords, and we decided to stuff it into database and analyze the data. So me and my friend, uh, we looked at gender, we categorized by whether the people were wearing glasses in the pictures or not. The pictures were uh, pictures from access cards, physical access cards. We also categorized by hair color, saying, well, there's no hair present. It could be blonde, super blonde, brunette, redhead, black, or silver fox. You probably understand what I mean by that. And of course, you can also have facial hair. So we said, well, there's no facial hair. There's the mustache, the small beard, the full beard, and looking at these pictures, we had to define the category of Unix guru. I don't have to explain that anymore. And we also had a category of porn donuts. You probably know what that is as well. No, we don't. <laughs> yeah, the very short one around your mouth. That's the porn donut. That's like back in the 80s and watching American crime on TV, I guess. That's a porn star. Okay, porn star. Okay. So we did this, stuffed this into database, then we could do, do the queries. And what we did, well, we found that women prefer length. On average, women had longer passwords than men. And we also found that men prefer a higher variety or character entropy. They use more different letters from the alphabet and special characters in the passwords. And we also found that Unix gurus have the absolutely worst passwords. Now, I know what company this is about because, uh, you know, I was doing pen testing for them. So I know sort of the reasoning behind this as well. Uh, IT services company, perhaps. Um, but it, it was a lot of fun. Now, the crazy thing about this, because this is, you know, me and, and a friend of mine doing this while we we're partially drunk, and we thought this was incredibly funny. But I, I presented this in many, many talks, and one day, BBC News decided to do an article about that. And if you go online and Google search, I mean, you can't see it there too, too easy here, but you can find the original uh, article from BBC News where they are basically saying that women prefer longer passwords or wing, women prefer length. And as you just heard from the male audience in here as well, laughing, uh, that I remember when that, when that article was published from BBC News, you know, the, reading the comments for that article was kind of crazy. Did you, BBC News, just write that women prefer length and that is now scientifically statistically proven, that's um, interesting. And I have talked to people that are really good in statistics and they say, well, if you have a selection of 5,000 people and you can say that from based on that, women prefer length, then you are correct about the entire population on planet Earth. 
until somebody can prove you wrong. So kind of funny. But you're going to have other interests, uh, other interests in life than passwords. So I also take a huge interest in pin codes as well. And uh, back in fall of 2013, I went to a local school in Bergen, my hometown, and did a talk about well, passwords, obviously. And I asked the girls and the boys in the room to write down a four-digit pin that they were absolutely sure they could remember in a month if I were to return and ask them, do you remember your pin code? Four-digit pin. Now, any wild guesses on, you know, the choice of pin code? Birthday. Birthdays, yeah. Well, I can reveal that the girls, the most popular pin code selected by the girls was 1996. And that's their year of birth. I can also reveal to you that among the boys, 1996 was the second most popular pin code. But which four digit pin code was the most commonly selected pin code among 17 year old boys? This audience test never fails. If there are men responding first, it's going to be 69, 69, or 1, 2, 3, 4. Thus proving the, you know, superior intelligence of men. And even funnier, if there is a woman responding first, she will also say 69, 69, or 1, 2, 3, 4, thus proving that women actually understand men. But the thing is, the most selected pin code among these boys was 1337. Now, the fun thing here is with this audience at that school, when I said, how many of you selected 1337? A few of these boys, they just went like, yeah, dude, whoa, whoa. And all the girls in the room, they were just like, what happened now? Because there was no women, no girls in here that selected 1337. Now, what is 1337? Hands up. Any women? Cecilia knows. You know, yep. So you read the numbers as letters. That means L E E T, LEET, short for elite. If you play computer games, you play against somebody else, they are really good and a round of World of Warcraft or Call of Duty or whatever, you will type in 1337 saying like, whoa, you're really good. When I explained that in this audience with these students, all the girls, no exceptions, oh God. <laughs> and then I went to the university in Trondheim in Norway, a little bit further up north. Now we're talking students, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. And I also showed this. And there was one woman in the room that raised her hand and said, yep, I picked 1337. And obviously I ran up to her like, wow, you could be the girl of my dreams. I just got to make sure, you know, do you play computer games? Because that's sort of, well, something that I do still at age 50. And she said, no, I don't. But I, I do have male friends that play computer games, but I don't. Okay, well, <laughs> shit. Uh, that's too bad. But why did you select 1337? And her response was, well, my postal address just outside the capital of Oslo is 1337. And obviously, all the male students were just like, okay, I know I'm moving. <laughs> so, a bit of fun, a bit of fun <laughs> statistics and, and surveys for you. But again, this also proves something that I've been saying for many, many, many years. We are incredibly predictable when it comes to our choice in passwords and pin codes. And who you are your interests, your gender, your age, your parents, your family, wherever you work, the 
stuff that you have in your office cubicle will most probably be association elements for your password. So here's also something that I did uh, several years ago. This is Marta Löge. She was a master thesis student and uh, she got an assignment from me. I was co-supervisor. Look into how people pick uh, their lock patterns, Android lock patterns. And she did. Um, uh, she also spoke about this here at PasswordsCon. She also did a talk at DEF CON about this. Uh, she discovered that, well, at least 10% of us will just do a simple English alphabet letter when you select an Android look pattern. She got the best possible score for a master thesis. She got lots of questions and fantastic feedback at DEF CON. And even better, in my opinion, uh, a couple of years after she finished, graduated and delivered her master thesis, she got an email from the police in one country somewhere in Europe. And they said, thank you for that research, because that actually enabled them to get into a phone that they were not able to get into otherwise and finding pictures revealing information related to abuse and a murder in a close relationship. So I'm not doing this just for the fun of it. This is lots of serious stuff. And then Steve Jobs came on, on stage and introduced the iPhone 5S with the touch ID and somebody tweeted a picture that, you know, summarizes, summarizes my opinion on biometric security in the one single picture. That's my opinion on biometric security. In almost all cases, biometric security is not biometric security, it is biometric usability. It increases usability by a lot. I use biometrics myself on my iPhone, but I could just swipe left or right and have a go at your pin code in any case. So if you want to have good security on your iPhone or your Android device, you need a really strong pin, even if you are using biometrics, otherwise it will be easy for me to get into your phone. And also when uh, people got hold of their iPhone 5S, there were some guys in Japan doing this video because you don't really need to use your finger. Any part of your skin that has <coughs> wrinkles can be used. So if you want to, before going to DEF CON <laughs> and you're afraid somebody is going to steal your fingerprints on your phone, don't use your finger, use uh, another part of your body. So I like to troll people. And with a CISO at another company back home in Norway, I'm having a little bit of fun. I, I don't know how this started, but what we do is every time there is a leak or some company, especially in Norway, is getting hacked, I say it's because of passwords. There's a shitty password, there's a default password, there's lack of two-factor authentication, there's something related to passwords that essentially made them get hacked. And he says, it, 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 it cannot be that bad. It cannot be happening that often. It's zero days. It's uh, Russian intelligence services that are using advanced hackers and everything. And I say, no, you can hack pretty much anyone using simple pins or passwords. And whenever I'm right, the problem is password related. Um, and we are on video, so I can't really play sound here. That's right. He, um, he needs to watch Bee Gees, You Win Again, and to add it on YouTube. And whenever he wins, because somebody got hacked and it was not because of bad passwords, I have to listen to Shaggy, it wasn't me. I have watched that video, I don't know, maybe two times, and he seriously fucking hate the Bee Gees. 
And he does this every time. The entire music video on YouTube, Bee Gees, you win again. So uh, here he is in Romania because he was traveling and suddenly I had to send him the link to the video and he just knew that, oh shit, it happened again. So uh, that's my short fun talk. And now the man, the legend himself, passwords but make it nihilism, Jeremy Gosling. How you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Uh, yeah, likewise. It's been like, what, three years, four years? Six. Oh, shit, right, because of Trump, yeah. One, one president and one pandemic, and I'm not sure what was the I, worst part. I've had three kids in that amount of time, man. It's crazy. All right. No one give me COVID. All right. So as Pear said, I'm Jeremy Gosney, and I'm here to tell you that you all fucking suck at threat modeling passwords. We've been doing it wrong for years. Please get your frame throwers ready. Actually, what we're gonna do, don't just take my word for it. We're gonna walk through it together. We're gonna threat model password security right here, right now. And you're gonna see that it's all bullshit. We've been doing it wrong the entire time. So I've been getting looped into Twitter threads for the past, I don't know what, seven years. People like crying about like, oh, this site only accept a maximum of 16 passwords. Can you believe it? Oh, hashtag password too strong and shit like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say I'm tired of it, but my wife will tell you when I get drawn into these Twitter threads, I sigh. <laughs> and she's like, what, what Twitter drama is it now? Like nothing, like, you know, like, you know, so-and-so is pulling me into some bullshit on Twitter and I gotta, you know, set them straight. But let's just back up a minute. So. I used to say, and I've been quoted saying this, I mean like Adam Shostak's book on threat modeling saying this, that password hashing is an insurance policy. And I thought this was really clever when I came up with this. I said that password hashing is an insurance policy that an organization is essentially buying to buy themselves time in the event of a breach to notify users and then to notify users, you know, so they can change their passwords uh, before that they're exploited on other sites. And then when we also talk about password uh, uh, threat modeling, we talk about how the threat modeling for password, for user password uh, creation should assume that every site stores their passwords in plain text, right? So the, these two threat models are kind of at odds with each other. So, uh, and you have to forgive me, I don't actually have a talk actually prepared. <laughs> these are just a bunch of notes. So, um, do I have a what? Oh, David. this is not this is not a speaker request. This is just me being very glad that you're here. <laughs> so I appreciate you. You would. What is, is it? This scotch? Acceptable? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's acceptable. All right. All right. We want the talk. That's how you do a talk. We want the talk <laughs> extra spicy. So. I appreciate that. Well, fucking cheers, you guys. Yeah. So for those that don't know, I didn't think I was going to make it this year. Um, been like really financially strapped with the demise of terror hash if anyone's followed that bullshit. Um, but someone stepped up and said like, no, you guys have to fucking come to Vegas. So they sponsored our trip. I just drove from Texas with my wife and four children. We've been in the car for four days together. We just got here an hour ago. So yeah, I, it's, it's been a stressful four days. So cheers y'all. <laughs> Woo. That's the first shot I've taken in three, three years. Goddamn. All right. So, why does it taste like pork? <laughs> Was that bacon scotch? Whew. Fuck, man. All right. So, where, where even were we? All right. So, no. Anyway, like I was saying, uh, I didn't think we were going to make it. So, I kind of stopped working on this talk. This talk was just like a seed. And then I was like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to make it. So I didn't actually develop it. So um, I just got a bunch of notes here. So, um, oh, anyway, so yeah, uh, I used to say that, that uh, the threat model for password security on, uh, on an organization side starts with the password database being compromised up to and including physical theft. Like that's, that's where the threat model starts is password database is compromised. On the user side, it's, we assume that the service providers is storing the passwords in plain text, right? So that's where we've kind of uh, assumed that the threat models were for the past, I don't know what, decade or so. But um, things are a little bit different now, right? So password hashing was invented 
on multi-tenant Unix systems, right? Where you can just run get ENT and get everyone's passwords for you know all the users. And and even then, you know, you can still get everyone's uh, you know uh, even even with password hashing with the invention uh, of Descript, you can still get people's Descript encrypted passwords for everyone on the network. Uh, we don't have that problem anymore. We don't really have, you know, too many enterprise multi-tenant environments where there's multiple users with the same shell to the same system, right? Even in uh, in, a, in a hosting context, we have virtual machines or you know containers or something. At that point, we have some kind of uh, isolation, right? You're not going to jump onto you know some cloud provider and run you know get ENT password and see all the other users for EC2 you know, on the machine. It doesn't work like that anymore. Um, it's the same thing with like uh, um, the way that we kind of assume for password hashing that sites are designed, that websites are designed, the services are designed. When we talk about, you know, like, oh, a, a vulnerability in a web app can compromise, you know, the database, like, yes, it absolutely can. But, you know, we're kind of thinking of more of an old monolithic model, not a modern day, like, you know, modern web app, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, cloud native microservices type architecture, um, you know, distributed, uh, usually with a hosted database or something like, you know, DynamoDB or, or Redis or something like that, right? So, um, what I want to do is this is going to involve everybody. Uh, where's Pear? Do you have something to write with, including a computer to type on? Okay, we're going we're gonna to take notes here. It is. <laughs> All right. Does this type in English? <laughs> I've said it to uh, Russian Kyrillic, but uh, whatever we want. Uh, Word. Word is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we're perfect, right? Control N. That works. Okay, so I'm gonna go first. We're gonna re-threat model passwords right here on the spot. I've already done this. I wanna see if us as a group come up with the same thing. So physical theft, Where are, what are our threat vectors for password database being physical theft? Anybody, shout it out. What's that? No, no, no. We're talking about the threat itself, the threat modeling. Assuming the crowd knows how to threat model, we're talking about we're we're enumerating the threats right now. So let's say physical threat. The first, the first threat we have. That's perfect. Yes. So we have a malicious insider. We actually had this at a company I worked for, where I was the director of information security. We had an employee who would replace a hard disk in a RAID five array, one disk every month to rebuild the array, taking the old perfectly good drive so he could reassemble the RAID array at home, stole an entire database, right? So, <laughs> all right, so let's, uh, oh, where is left? Go to left, computer left, I don't know, fuck it, all right, whatever, so, Physical theft, that's a new page, whatever, bucket. All right, so we have a uh, malicious insider, right? And that could be self-hosted or a colo provider, right? Where the hell's the dash? All right, I'm just gonna hit equals. Oh, that's a zero, whatever. Okay. What about in the cloud where we have shared databases, right? We could have an employee who has access to the hosted database as well, right? So let's say uh, hosted, right? Okay. So taking a step up from physical theft, what's another threat that we're combating against with, with, with passwords? We have to combat against passwords. What's another threat to passwords? Okay. Online brute force, right? Where we have a login on a web page and a user is trying something. Uh, like Hydra, right, to uh, uh, enumerate uh, username and passwords. So we'll say online brute. Okay, what's another threat in our threat? Malware? 
Okay, keyloggers, like it. I love it. Okay. Well, I heard two different things at once, and I'm deaf in both ears. Oh, like sequel injection, you mean? Okay. Great. Not great. Okay, and what did you say? Fishing. Okay. What else do we have in our threat model? What was it? Oh, rubber hose technique. For those who don't know, I was a 97 Echo in the Army. That was interrogator, so I love it. All right. Backups, that's great. I'm actually going to put that up here with physical theft. Goddamn right she did, Karen. I'm at, that's also physical theft, because that's going to go, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was going to put sticky note, but post it. We'll use the copyrighted term. All right. How about remote code injection? We have a legitimate flaw in the application where we're actually executing RCE and we have access so we can read the databases, right? Okay, I, I will allow it. This is a good list. What was that? Okay, I like that one. That's, that's thinking outside the box. Was that Jim Fenton that said that? Holy shit, sir, how are you? Call me a fucking legend. There's Jim Fenton right there. Okay. What else do we have in our threat model for passwords? Default passwords. Default passwords. <laughs> oh. Someone laughed. You guys know what Prop 6 is? In California, you have to disclose what causes cancer. So... It was oh six oh I'm sorry, it's that bacon it's that bacon scotch, forgetting numbers. Okay, is there any oh yes sir? <laughs> you know what? I'm laughing, but I can see where that is something that's plausible because they sell everything else about us, right? Any other identifiable information they sell. So why the fuck not sell our passwords as well? I would buy them. <laughs> okay. Does anybody, can anyone think of any other threat in our threat model for password security? Any other threats to passwords? Okay, I'm just going to put that under a generic man in the middles. Does that work? You like it? Awesome. We can, I'm going to put, I'm going to, I'm going to lump that under man in the middle because in order to exploit, are you talking in transit or at rest? So if it's at rest, I'm going to go ahead and say that's covered by things like RC and physical theft. And if it's in transit, I'm going to lump that under man in the middle. Are we good with that? Okay. This is democracy in action. Okay. Yes, sir. Do people do that? Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Uh oh. Are you getting unruly? Oh, come here, little man. This is my two year old Malachi. Everyone say hi, Malachi. Uh, Malachi doesn't like passwords because it prevents him from watching YouTube. Can you say hi? Yeah, I love it. Hard coded pass. Hard coded pass. No, he's right. So I'm, I'm going to say that hard-coded passwords are slightly different than, than default passwords because a user is aware of a default password, right? But a user may not be aware of a hard-coded password. And we see that time and time again, especially with network devices. Cisco, Juniper, they love hard-coded backdoor passwords, don't they? So I'm going to go ahead and say hard, 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 code. Okay. Anything else in our threat model before we go through these? I'll allow it. I'll allow side channels. If I can spell it. Oh, 
You see a rainbow? Whoa, Whoa shit. Is it right there? Mm. Yeah, there it is. That's for adults, though, buddy. That's a daddy beverage. Okay. I know it is a rainbow. It's a beautiful cup. Okay. All right. Shoulder surfing? You know what? I will allow that, too. I'm going to put that under physical. How physically you have to be to shoulder surf depends on the user. Okay. Okay, so, so let's, I, yeah, you're right, you're right. So the password is cracked, probably on another site, right? So I'm going to go ahead and say that that's covered by password reuse in the event that, the, that the password is breached on another site and cracked and then credential stuffed, right? And then for ones that aren't, I'm going to say that's covered by online brute force, right? Is that fair? Is there anything I'm missing there? I'm just, I'm just being fair. I may be missing something. This bacon scotch is fucking with me. Yes, sir. A tempest attack. Whoo. Okay. Does, does everyone know what a tempest attack is? All right. Thank God. All right. It's a side channel. That's actually what I was going to. You are correct, but side channel, sir. Oh, yes, sir. In the back. What is it? A candy bar? Like you give them a candy bar for the password? Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna put that under fishing, or social engineering, or something there. Uh, I like it though. I like it. Yeah, and there's also uh, we had this one here too, right? The the, uh, the buying the passwords, right, or selling the passwords. Hey, Buddy, I'm gonna have to hide this from you. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So, is everyone comfortable with the threats in our threat model? all the possible threats to password security. All right, here's what we're gonna do. And you're not gonna be happy about this. Put on a helmet, cause I'm about to blow your mind. Okay. Now, for the militia, for the, for the physical threats, right? Cause remember, I, I even said, I'm in fucking like ink in a book saying that Password security starts with, you know, physically with, with, with the password database being compromised. That's where the threat model starts. And I'm telling you, I was wrong. Tell me where length and complexity will defend against any of these. Who can think of one scenario for physical theft where length and complexity matter? Oh, shoulder surfing. Clever. So you're, you know what? I'm going to put an X next to that one. Potentially, yes. If you're trying to shoulder surf someone and they have a ridiculous fucking god awful fuck you password, you'd have to be like Rain Man to pick that shit up, right? So. That's true. They got, they got the, they got the, the they got the, yeah, they got the unified camera in the corner recording it. So, um, but you're right. You're, you, you are right. That is a potential mitigation for shoulder surfing is make your, make your password so complex no one could possibly shoulder surf it. So I like that. All right. I will accept that. Okay. Now let's go down to online brute force. Now keep in mind, have any of you actually performed online brute force? Okay. How fast did it go? Slow. Extremely slow, right? Okay. So in order to make online brute force practical, you pretty much have to have a botnet or some sort of distributed infrastructure. And that's assuming they don't do rate limiting or account lockout, right? If they do rate limiting, now you have to also have like, you know, a different IP address trying like, you know, a handful of attempts to try to slide under the radar, right? It's not easy to do online brute force. Your guesses for online brute force have to be highly targeted, right? So I'm going to argue that length and complexity are rather irrelevant for online brute force because for online brute force, you're either trying a credential list or something really, really fucking dumb like company name one, summer 2022, right? 
Does everyone agree with that? If you even have a moderately complex password, it's probably not going to get cracked by online brute force. Okay? Key loggers. Does length and complexity defend against key loggers in any capacity? Do you want to do what? I can't, I can't, I can't hear you talking to my good ear. Oh, I'm right here. You, you want to see me? I'm right here. Oh, you want to see this? Oh, no. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, brother. Oh, you found the rainbow cup. Oh. <sighs> Toddlers will get into anything. All right. You do? All right, here. You show me. You show me. Yeah, no, that's, that's not okay. Okay. Okay, buddy. All right. All right, sequel injection. So I'm going to go ahead and start by prefacing this, saying that modern web app frameworks have made SQL injection less and less prevalent. Does anyone here do pen tests like daily? How often do you find SQL injection now compared to five years ago? More and more rare, right? In fact, on the OWASP top 10, it's fallen from number one, where it sat for fucking ever, to number three. Right? And it's not even just SQL injection, that's all injections. They finally woke up and lumped all injection attacks together because they basically are the same fucking attack. It is injecting different things, right? I might be injecting fucking PHP in this attack or injecting, you know, uh, SQL in this attack, but it's all fucking injection. You know, even cross site scripting is just, you know, JavaScript or HTML injection, right? So they lumped all injection together and it's fallen to number three. So modern web app frameworks are, it's not obsolete, don't get me wrong. It's just harder to fuck up and code SQL injection today than it was five years ago. And OWASP has shown this. It's fallen from number one to number three, right? And I'm also going to say, too, with today's distributed architecture, these servers handling the web app processing may not, and in fact likely are not, the same ones that handle authentication, depending on the size and complexity of the app. When we as you know, cryptographers or password geeks think about this, we think about monolithic application running on one server. But that just really isn't the truth, especially for, you know, anything even remotely complex these days. You want to see blue? Who's blue? Right here? Lord, child. Okay. Um, no, Bubs. Hey, do you want to watch YouTube? Do you want to watch Dinosaurs? You watch dinosaurs? Yeah. You see your mom? Yeah. You see mommy? Yeah. Go get dinosaurs. Run. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he looks just like me, doesn't he? <laughs> All right. So, keeping the things I just said in mind, SQL injection may or may not yield password hashes. Or it may yield only password hashes, right? And not the user's data that's part of the application. Or it may yield everything, right? Not just the password hashes, but all the data that the user has stored in the application, thus making the password hashes less attractive because you already have all the data that's inside the app in the database, right? So there's basically three different vectors here for SQL injection. We have SQL injection. Why is there no dash on your keyboard? Where do you hide? Which Weijin? Where's the dash? How can I do SQL injection without a dash? English, but still. Oh, it's down there. Oh, well, now it's American, so now you got to be there. That's what I was hitting before. It kept giving me zeros. Okay. All right. Thank you, Pear. Now you have the US layout. But... I love you, buddy. Okay. So we have SQL injection with hashes. And I'm going to say SQL I with hashes plus plus. You said it was the American layout. This is not the freedom layout. All right, uh, with user data, right? And we have SQL I. Uh, what did I say? With that. Without. Hashes 
but with data. All right, so, in the event of SQL injection with hashes, there is a chance, of course, that length and, compa and, and complexity could, in fact, you know, uh, uh, mitigate this attack, right? So we'll put an X there. In this scenario, where we have both the hashes and the user data, it does fuck all nothing for the most part, right? And then without hashes, but with data, of course, it doesn't matter if you have latency complexity because all the data has been compromised. We don't even have hashes to crack, all right? All right, phishing. Does length and complexity matter for phishing? No, rubber hose. No, absolutely not. Okay, remote code injection. Nearly, oh, what? Plausible deniability. All right, you know what? I'll allow it. I'm going to put one slash. That's half an X for plausible deniability. Where you're going with that, though, is kind of where I'm going with this. So, yeah, so I'm giving half a slash. But no, you're, you're right, but that's kind of where I'm going. Okay, so remote code execution. If you have RCE on a system, in that case, like that, that goes back to what my original threat model was, right? Where password hashing becomes the insurance policy, right? Where or now we're trying to, you know, uh, have a strong password hashing algorithm to buy time for us to notify or identify the breach, contain the breach, notify users, and users have time to be notified and update their passwords and shit like that, right? But if you have RCE on a box, you can just attach to the process and read the passwords in plain text as they're being submitted. Right? You can sniff them from memory. You can scrape them from memory. Or you can sniff them over the wire. You know, like there's a lot of different vectors here that password hashing just doesn't defend against. Right? So for the most part, if someone has arbitrary code execution, length and complexity don't defend against that in any way. Password reuse. Does length and complexity defend or mitigate against password reuse? No. Oh. Oh, okay. So you're getting psychological now. <laughs> no, no, that's that's fair. That's fair. Okay. So, um, users who are inclined to create short passwords are also therefore more likely to be the users who use that same password everywhere. That's the argument. I will accept that argument. I will counter argue that what happens in reality is you end up with password bang Facebook, password bang Twitter. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And I, I, it, it pairs done a lot of research in that regard as well. I think you'd agree with that, that it, it tends to be, you're still reusing the same password. You just have your own password system. You know what I'm saying? The people who have their little systems for their passwords, it's really, it's the same fucking password. You just put some different bullshit on the end for each service. Oh, you were my replacement? Oh, yeah, my Hi, replacement buddy. <laughs> I read that and it was like, Jeremy will be missed. And I'm like, I'm right here. I'm not dead yet. Still have 1,600 miles to go. <laughs> All right, no, that was really funny. Nice to meet you. Okay, oh, oh, it's going dark on me. Okay, so. I'm going to put a question mark here for debatable. <laughs> All right, supply chain. We have some piece of malware that's been slipped in upstream, and we don't know about it. Now it's scraping our users' passwords, which length and complexity doesn't fucking defend against, does it? All right, default passwords. Length and complexity doesn't fucking defend. The service provider selling your passwords, because why the fuck wouldn't they when they sell everything else? Doesn't defend. Man in the middle. It doesn't defend. Hard-coded passwords, that's a little bit different because the user didn't, check, didn't select that password, right? But, like, let's say we're talking about a system with, like, you set the world's most longest and complex password for the root password, and you're like, ha-ha, no one can get in. But then someone's like, Cisco123, and they get in, right? You know, so, yeah. 
No, totally. I mean, yeah, like it didn't defend against that, did it? Side channels, maybe. I'm going to say that length and complexity could maybe defend against a side channel. Maybe. Depending on how reliable the side channel is. If it's a flaky side channel, a shorter password probably has more of a chance to be caught than a longer password, right? So, maybe. That was it. That was everything we came up with. Okay? Now, we have the threats, and we have the risks, and we have the mitigations. Out of all of these things, does length and complexity matter? What is the one thing that will defend against all of this? Can anybody name it? The Okay, the second thing. <laughs> Unique passwords. Unique. My proposal now is that the only fucking thing that matters with regards to password security is not length. Not complexity, not anything else, not emojis, not any of this other shit, not even the underlying password hashing function. Because again, as a user, our threat model assumes that the service provider is storing the passwords in plain text, right? So I propose that the new threat model for password security is that the only one thing that matters is uniqueness. You want to sit on it? the best oh that's really cold that's really good man get that kid a raise okay so oh uh-huh okay so let's break down that scenario okay so this scenario is let's say we have a way to crack or gain access to a person's password when we log into the server. Everybody's got the same, the same thing you name when I get to it. You just mm -hmm. type in A, 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 B, A, A, B, and try it with one password. Now, we have some, and you want to use some or two passwords. Sure, right, 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 right. Right? And at some point, it will get a use to this. And look at that one, which is a unique password that could have been used before and we gave it. It wasn't by all users. Okay, and congratulations. Now, You've gotten one user out of all my users. <laughs> right so even with and, I, and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna address something that we also don't really talk about in the password space password strength is an unsolved problem we have not solved the problem of how to measure password strength how to measure how strong a password is we already know that shannon entropy is bullshit right we're not creating encryption keys oh it's fine let it die let it die. Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> no, uh, we're not crazy. Shannon Entropy has nothing to do with passwords. We typically measure passwords in terms of key space, but even then, key space is irrelevant if the key space is one because it's in our fucking dictionary, right? So we have yet, as of 2022, this is like a fucking Millennium Prize problem, is how to measure uh, the strength of a, and security of a user-created password. A machine-created password is easy. We can do easy math on that, assuming the source of random is sufficiently random, which, <laughs> where's the scotch? But, you know, uh, but as far as a, a user created string, we have no way of measuring. There's been some really novel approaches, some really cool shit's been done in the space, but none of us really actually solved that problem. So even if you try to implement some kind of control, you know, to defend against the creative user who creates, a, you know, variation of summer 22 that bypasses all the complexity checks and meets the minimum length requirements, right? Like there has to be some kind of margin of error for human stupidity and human creativity because password rates not solve problem. Now, the best way to solve that is to get rid of passwords, which FIDO2 is pretty well poised to do that. Thank you, Water Fairy. Okay, so do you agree? <laughs> no, no. All right, one to center. All right, does anyone else have a rebuttal? Go ahead.
Okay, so let's talk about so uh, when I say the only require the only requirement that matters is uniqueness, right? So what I'm saying, what I'm proposing is that shifts the threat model for users to basically just be password managers, right? Where we have a password manager creating a unique password for each one of our sites and services. So we don't have users creating passwords. We have unique passwords that are being generated and created for every, every service, right? So does that clarify that? So we don't have users really creating dumb passwords. I think that addresses both things. So, because that's the path to unique, right? The path to unique is to remove humans and our dumb, squishy, predictable brains from the password creation process entirely. Yes, sir. It fucking doesn't. So you're right, it doesn't defend against all of them. But that was also a really unique one that I hadn't considered, but it's also highly plausible. <laughs> so, oh, the question was, how does having a unique password defend against a service provider who's actually selling your passwords? You know, and when I first went through this threat model by myself, I had not considered that that was not in my threat model, but I think it's highly plausible because again, they sell everything else about us. Why would they not sell passwords? And people like me would buy them. I fucking wouldn't heartbeat if fucking Twitter put up a thing like, you know, to, to the ad networks to, to like, you know, the ad partners been like this data set includes, you know, username, email address, plain text password fucking sold. Take out a second mortgage. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. So hit me up, Twitter. They will. <laughs> exactly. You as a user won't have any fucking clue. Yes, sir. No, one, one, one account, one password, right? So each and every account that you have you create a new password for, and the only way to do that is essentially with a password manager to manage all that for you. No, there's no reason to change your password if you don't suspect it's been compromised, right? And as we went through the threat model, the threats of compromising the password, a lot of those things, the password itself is irrelevant, right? So changing isn't gonna do anything for 90% of the things in the threat model. Of course. Good. That's right, you can. Yes, it's like your own little canary. So basically what he said is if you're using a unique username and a unique password like free site and service, you now know who gets breached based on what spam you receive at different email addresses, right? Or, or what, if you get blackmail attempts or things like that, right? You fucking know because you're only using one set of credentials for one site or service. It's like your own little canary out there. So, all right. Does anyone have anything else? No? Oh, 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 oh. Another password to manage your password manager. <laughs> you do. You do. So I'm going to very, very quickly address this because this is, again, this is all, this is shit that I put out on Twitter like 25 times a month to where I'm blue in the fucking face. And like, you're right. So you have your password manager, which generates all your passwords for you, except for your master password for your password manager, in which case you have to commit that to memory, right? And that's most of the grievance of people on Twitter who are like, it only allows 30 characters for my password. Holy shit, how insecure. Like, Unless you have to create a password, you have to commit a memory for that site and service. It doesn't fucking matter. Your password only has to be 12 or 13 characters long for me not to crack it, right? So then for your master password, right? Your password manager is employing a proper key derivation function that is slow as fucking shit. And, 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 and I'm not going to be able to try, you know, my usual you know, 750 billion guesses per second against your master password. I'm just not without incurring massive expense. And are you worth it? Do I want to expend that kind of, you know, capital just to crack your password? You know, are you important enough for that? <laughs> like, I'm not demeaning you, good sir. I'm sure you're perfectly upstanding human being. I love your smile, but 
You know, I'm not going to drop $5 million to crack your password. I'm not. Fuck you. So, yeah. For your password manager, master password, which employs a proper key derivation function, you don't have to have anything that strong. Even a seven character random password, which is easy to remember, will be pretty fucking secure. If it's hashed with like, you know, Argon 2 with an insanely high number to where your, you know, runtime is like, you know, greater than thousand milliseconds, right? So it's simple stuff. Once you saw, once you bring it down to this level, password security becomes fucking easy, you know? Like it's, it's like, you know, mom and dad can do it type shit. All right, one more thing, and then I'm gonna concede the mic to the people who wanna clear the room. How will it HSM factor into this? So, on a service, are you talking about a user level or at a organization level? On a user level, I would say an HSM wouldn't play much of a difference, but on a service provider level, assuming you have good secrets management, right, for the HSM, like you don't even have to do expensive password hashing in that case. You can just do an HMAC with a key that's stored in the HSM. And it doesn't matter if the password hash is released because I don't have the fucking key in the HSM, right? So I'm never going to crack those passwords. Um, does that answer your question? Awesome. All right. So since no one else has any strong disagreements, I'm going to say I win. All right. Thank you, guys. Good to see everybody again after three years. And I'm really not sure what to say now. It's like, Jeremy, I... <clears throat> you don't disagree with me. I... <laughs> yeah, but I really enjoyed doing this conference and suddenly I don't see the point anymore. It's... Uh... <laughs> Thank you, passwords, but yeah. make it nihilism. Now you understand the title. Jim, I need some help here. Tell me why should I continue to do passwords comp because it seems pointless now. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I have no further questions for this one. Absolutely awesome. Uh, obviously, uh, you will stay around uh, today and for um, a few more days as well. Or I'll be here till Sunday, Monday, Sunday or Monday. Hit him up and try to find some more arguments so we can continue to, to do passwords con. Uh, that was the end of passwords con for this for this round. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to Passwords Con. I love doing this. It is wonderful to be back in Vegas. Uh, for me, it's been six years since the last time I was here. I'm already looking forward to come back next year. And I hope you enjoy the rest of B-Sides and also attend the pool party today and see you around. I will also be at DEF CON. Specifically, I'm doing a talk at the uh, Crypto and Privacy Village on Friday uh, called um, ID theft insurance, the emperor's new clothing. So maybe I will see you there. And until then, thank you to everyone, to the volunteers, to all the staff of B-Sides, to everyone that has helped us out. And most importantly, all of you being here. Thank you.